Welcome, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes, good. <laughs> so welcome, everyone, to uh, this afternoon's event or this, e uh, this evening or this morning, if you're for some of you, entitled In Celebration of the Living Earth. And this is in honor of Earth Day. So happy Earth Day to everybody. And I'm delighted to let you know our speaker today is the wonderful Satish Kumar. My name is Andrew McCauley. I am the chair of the board of Kuduri Farm, and I'm delighted to be the uh, host and facilitator for this event. So this is the first in a series of online talks. Uh, that Kaduri Farm is offering as part of our evolving Kaduri Earth program. And we do have a lot to celebrate today. We are celebrating Earth Day. We are celebrating the living Earth. Here in Hong Kong, we are also celebrating the lifting of uh, social distancing restrictions, or, or some of them at least. And as part of that, um, the Kuduri farm is reopening, has reopened today. So uh, if you're in Hong Kong or wherever you are, please do come and visit the farm again. Today happens to also be the anniversary of um, the passing away of Kuduri farm's principal founder, Horace Kuduri. So we also honor Horace on this day. Many of you are joining from Hong Kong. Some of you are joining from other parts of Asia and some of you from Europe. So wherever you are, a very warm welcome to you. The talk today will be around uh, 30 minutes. And that will leave us plenty of time for question and answers. So what I would like to invite you to do while you're listening to the talk is to make a note of questions as they arise and maybe uh, refine them so that when it's time for the Q&A session, we can really make the most of that occasion. And I will be asking you then to put your questions in the chat box. If you're not familiar with Zoom, I invite you, if you like, to go to the top right hand corner of your screen where it says view and there you can you have options and you can click on speaker to have a better view of who is speaking. If you have any technical problems, then please feel free to uh, use the chat box to send a message to the panelists. session is being recorded. So it is my great delight to introduce our speaker, Satish Kumar. Many of you already know him, and some of you may have attended the season's greetings talk, which he kindly offered uh, for Kaduri Farm in December. Satish is one of the Earth's great champions. He is a global environmental elder, an elder for the environmental movement, I should say. And he has been a KFBG teacher for over 10 years. He was visiting annually up until 2020 when we had to abort his visit due to COVID, but we hope that he'll be back soon. Satish has been many things in this life. At the age of nine, he joined, uh, he became a monk joining the uh, Jain order. And at the age of 18, he left the Jain order and joined a land reform movement in India, which was in the Gandhian tradition. In his early 20s, he undertook a peace pilgrimage, walking without food or money, all the way from India to Washington, DC. 
He wrote about this in his autobiography, No Destination, and also in his most recent book, Pilgrimage for Peace. After the peace pilgrimage, Satish settled in the United Kingdom, and he became the editor of Resurgence magazine at the invitation of Bertrand Russell, famous uh, English philosopher and activist who inspired his peace pilgrimage. In 1991, Satish established the Schumacher College in Devon in England, and this has been pioneering holistic education with a wonderful range of courses and retreats, and also a master's degrees uh, opportunities. And it was in this connection that Kuduri Farm encountered uh, Satish, and, and we had the great good fortune to meet him. Above all, for myself and for many others, Satish has been a wonderful friend and mentor. So please join me in welcoming Satish. Thank you, Andrew. That is a, a warm and wonderful introduction and welcome. It is my pleasure to be part of this Earth Day celebration uh, organized by Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. And as you mentioned, Andrew, uh, that is also a, an anniversary day of the found, one of the founders of Kaduri Farm. And I have been coming to Kaduri Farm for more than 10 years because I think um, Kaduri Farm is a gem uh, on this earth. And an Earth Day celebration and a celebration of Kaduri Farm and what you and your fam family and your team has achieved uh, during these um, many decades is uh, a wonderful thing. And I congratulate everyone, including yourself uh, and your family for keeping this farm going as a symbol of celebration of the earth. Uh, before I start um, speaking about uh, celebration of the earth, I would like to read a short meditation with your permission, Andrew. Um, in Indian tradition, we greet each other by joining hands together. The right palm represents the world, the earth, and all other living beings. And the left palm represents the self. And by bringing these two palms together, we bring the world, the earth, and all other beings and ourselves together as we are all interrelated, we are all um, interconnected as the two palms connect each other. So I would like to greet you all with my two palms together and, and, and welcome you for this meeting. I will read this meditation, which is a kind of celebration of the earth and particularly the unity of life. Let's bow to sacred earth, sacred soil, sacred universe and sacred life. We see all beings in us. We see whole universe in ourselves and ourselves in the whole universe. Each one of us are a microcosm of macrocosm. Cosmos is our country. The planet earth is our common home. Nature is our nationality and love is our true religion. All living beings are sustained by the same breath of life. Thus, we are all connected. We are all related. We are interbeings. We all share a single origin. Unity and diversity dance together. All our thriving is mutual. When separation and divisions end, suffering ceases. We go beyond right and wrong, beyond good and bad, and then we bow to the unity of life. We bow to the diversity of forms. We bow to the sacred, to life, to the earth to the universe. Please breathe in, breathe out, smile, relax, 
and let go. Let go of all anxieties, attachments, fears, anger, and ego. Please feel at home on this planet Earth, in the bosom of our Mother Nature and Mother Earth. Thank you. <coughs> in our scientific, rational, and materialistic worldview, we have looked at the Earth in the past and even in some places now, and see the earth as a dead rock. And life, we see a very limited form. Of course, we see human life, but sometimes people even doubt that animals have life or an animals have soul. But the earth is a dead rock. But in the last 20, 30 years, a new science is emerging. A new science is a science of Gaia. And those of you who have not heard of this word Gaia, I would like to say that it's a Greek word and also just Sanskrit word. So the Indo-European cultures meet and languages meet. Uh, in Greek, the Gaia is a goddess earth. And from the word Gaia comes geology, geography, geometry, and so on. And so one of the great uh, British scientists and his uh, companion and friend and colleague, American scientist, her name was Lynn Margulis, and the English British scientist was James Lovelock. They worked together and saw how a dead rock can support life. How can a dead rock, the earth, can maintain all the temperature and climate and all the balance of life altogether? And so both of them came together. And it was a wonderful combination, uh, uh, a European scientist and an American scientist, uh, a male scientist and a female scientist coming together and working together as a holistic uh, scientific worldview and a vision. And they came up with this theory of Gaia. And they came up with the idea that Earth is not a dead rock. Earth is a living organism. Earth is alive. And then that science has developed and has become very prominent, in, particularly among the environmental scientists environmental philosophers and environmental thinkers. And many other people have followed, like Thomas Berry, uh, for example. He said, Earth is a community and we are members of one Earth community. And the birds flying in the sky are our brothers and sisters, our family members. The animals in the forest, tigers and elephants, giraffe and snakes. They are our brothers and sisters. The trees and the rivers and the oceans, all living beings are our brothers and sisters. This is the earth community. What um, uh, Aldo Leopold, a great American writer called biotic community. And Thomas Berry called it earth community. The moment you see earth as a, as a family, Earth as a community and the Earth as a living organism, Earth is alive, then nature <clears throat> becomes a different uh, phenomenon. Nature is no longer separate from us. The old scientific worldview has seen nature and humans as separate. Nature out there, the mountains, the forests, the rivers, the animals, the birds, and we humans separate. And then First, we have this dualistic phenomena, dualistic thinking, dualistic philosophy, and dualistic science, that nature is separate, humans are separate. And then we say humans have dominion over the earth. Humans have control over the earth. And all the 
species of the earth, animals and forests and rivers and oceans and all the other living beings are there for human use, for benefit of the humankind. And not only all humankind, but some special top class, wealthy, privileged and rich humankind. So this exploitation and domination of nature has come from this idea of separation from nature. But James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis and, and Thomas Berry and Aldo Leopold, these wonderful um, scientists have come with the idea that nature and humans are not separate. If we go to the idea of evolution, we all share single origin. We all come from the Big Bang. At that time, there was no forest, there were no animals, there were no birds, there were no humans, only gases. Then after millions and billions of years, maybe water emerged. And then after billions of years, some vegetation. And after billions of years, some moving creatures, uh, some insects, and finally animals and humans. So all natural phenomena, mountains and forests, rivers and oceans, animals and birds and insects, they are our ancestors. And so this is the link, the single origin that we have, which makes us all one and united. And we, everything is made of basic elements. We are all made of earth, air, fire, water, and space and time. And then if you take the Gaia hypothesis and Gaia science um, and Gaia theory, uh, then uh, whole earth is a living organism. And therefore um, we are made of consciousness. We are made of spirit. So nature is intelligent. Nature has consciousness. And this is a kind of like scientist like Rupert Sheldrake who have come up with the idea of morphic resonance. So the, the, the nature has a memory, nature has intelligence. And this is, scientists are coming with this idea which has been there uh, among spiritual, religious, um, artistic, uh, philosophers and, and poets. If you take William Blake, for example, he said, nature is imagination itself. Now that's imagination cannot be a part of a dead rock. <clears throat> so William Blake understood uh, the living quality and the living nature and the conscious uh, nature and the intelligent nature. But the scientists who can only measure and, and they think that what cannot be measured does not exist. Only thing what can be measured exists. So it's a measurement is a matter. Measure and matter and meter come from the same, same root. And so uh, when you say only what exists is matter, which can be measured and nothing else, then you become materialist. There is no spirituality, there is no consciousness, there is no soul, there is no spirit, only matter. But, uh, and even Shakespeare, uh, in, in the English great uh, playwright and poet, uh, Shakespeare, he uh, understood uh, the living quality of nature. And that is that tongues in trees, trees speak to us. They may not speak in English, but they speak in tree English. So we have to learn to listen to the trees, tongues in trees and books in running brooks. Shakespeare says that books are not what you see on your bookshelf uh, printed on a piece of paper but the nature is a living book, books in running brooks. So the book of nature is the greatest book. And, uh, and Shakespeare says further that the sermons in stones, stones are not just dead rock uh, without any life. They teach us sermons. You don't have to go to uh, a church on Sunday or a temple or, or, a, or a mosque or, or a synagogue to find a spiritual teachings. You sit and observe the rocks and listen to the rocks. And they are giving you the sermon of resilience 
and the sermon of patience and the sermon of wisdom and the sermon of love. So that's the kind of understanding that poets had. Uh, so, um, so tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones and good in everything. That is a kind of tradition which now scientists are uh, embracing. And of course, as I mentioned, that the word Gaia also appears in Sanskrit. And one of the greatest mantra of the Indian tradition and the Hindu culture is Gayatri mantra. The word Gaya mantra, Gaya is in the mantra, Gayatri mantra. And the tree means which something which saves us, which sustains us, which, uh, uh, which nurtures us uh, and nourishes us. That's the tree, Trata, tree. So this is also goddess Gaya uh, that sustains us and nourishes us. And in the Sanskrit and, uh, and Hindu philosophy, the word Gaya is not limited to just the living earth. Gaya is cosmic reality. And that cosmic reality, so Om Bhur Bhuva, so that includes uh, the, the galaxies, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the um, many, many other planets. So the whole cosmos is seen as a living organism. It's a living reality. That is a wonderful, great vision. So when we are celebrating our Earth Day, we are celebrating our planet Earth, precious planet Earth, our common home. But when you think about Gaia from an Indian perspective, the Earth Day becomes a cosmic day and, and a cosmic consciousness. And when you expand your mind to cosmo, cosmic level, then that is what Indians would say, mind of God. Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, a great British uh, scientist also wrote the, the brief history of time and in it, he eludes on the idea of the mind of God. And he says that one day scientists may find mind of God, but uh, I would like to tell him that uh, the, the moment you expand your mind on a cosmic level and you see all, uh, um, like, uh, all uh, existence uh, at a cosmic level in your con consciousness, you can expand your mind, you can expand your heart, and that is a mind of God. God is not something, a separate reality. God is not something or somebody like we have thought of as a human um, God uh, with big beard and long beard uh, and, and be behind the cloud somewhere. The God's presence is in everything. Uh, the, the Hindu philosophy of Gaia is that uh, uh, the trees and, and the mountains and the rivers are sacred, are holy. We go and worship uh, Ganges, river Ganges, as a symbol of all water being holy and sacred. And we go to the Mount Kailash and Himalayas and we uh, meditate there uh, and because mountains are sacred and holy. So that science of Gaia in the West uh, promoted by James Lovelock and Lynn Margulis and many others and the, science, and, and the philosophy of India, of Gaia. Um, the, if you bring them two, two together, that's a sort of cosmic vision of the earth day that we can embrace in our mind and then see the unity of life. We are all one and then we can celebrate the diversity, biodiversity, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, religious diversity, political diversity. So the Gaia and earth celebration and the celebration of the earth is to celebrate the diversity of life. You start with the unity, single origin. We celebrate unity, and then we celebrate diversity. The unity and diversity dance together. This is the message of uh, Earth Day. Unless we have a diversity and we celebrate diversity, and we turn diversity into division and into conflicts, then problems begin. So even among humans, we have created so much uh, division instead of diversity. So we fight in the name of nationality. It, we, we have this war going on in Ukraine and Russia. It's, it's a kind of uh, based on the idea of divisions and division creates conflict. 
if we celebrate diversity, then of course you have wonderful Ukrainian and wonderful Russian and wonderful European languages and nationalities and America and China and India and Japan and, and Australia, all Africa, all countries, uh, they have their own beauty, they have their own grace, they have their own contribution to make. So let us celebrate diversity and not turn diversity into divisions and conflicts and wars and, and, and exploitation and domination. That is the true message of the Earth Day. If we can uh, celebrate Earth Day uh, in this holistic way, then I think we can resolve many of our uh, 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 problems which we face today. Uh, climate change and global warming is one of the uh, highlight uh, of our problems and, and the kind of uh, headline problems. Uh, but behind that, um, uh, our oceans are being polluted with lots of plastic. Uh, our air is polluted. Our soil is being polluted with chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and, and whatnot. And, and many other biodiversity diminishing. And, and, and also among humans, poverty, inequality, injustice, social injustice, all these problems can be addressed by celebrating our earth and celebrating the diversity of the earth and celebrating the, the unity of the earth. And, and if we can do that, then I think we can start a new beginning, a new journey towards, um, towards a joyful life, which is possible. Uh, we can do, it's a journey. There's no destination. There's no fixed point where we can say that now we have arrived uh, to a, a, a utopia. There's no utopia. Um, uh, Earth Day is a symbol of uh, pilgrimage, a uh, symbol of journey, a symbol of um, moving towards embracing the unity and diversity and, and, and being more uh, gracious towards the Earth and, and celebrating the graciousness of the Earth. So we move from uh, glamorous to gracious. The modern society, uh, the, the industrial um, uh, consumer uh, and, and a more production, consumption, economic growth oriented society had moved more towards glamour, show, uh, and a kind of, um, a kind of uh, um, extravagance uh, and wastefulness. And that has created pollution. If we move away from that glamorous uh, uh, and living standards idea to more gracious, simple, elegant, and, and a wonderful life, joyful life, it can be abundant. Nature is abundant. There's no shortage of um, anything in nature. But um, we uh, humans in our uh, mistaken view of nature and, and uh, see earth as a dead rock and just to exploit for human benefit and on purpose of life is to have more production, more consumption, and, and that's uh, all human beings become the resource for the economy, that worldview uh, has been challenged by this new science of Gaia. So uh, in these few words, I would like to invite you to study Gaia, understand Gaia, and, and you are going to get uh, uh, next week another talk about Gaia from my uh, colleague and friend, Stefan Harding. Uh, and, and he will speak more, because he's a scientist. I'm more philosopher, and he's a scientist. So Stefan will explain more. But I would like to say, let us celebrate Gaia, let us celebrate Earth and be in tune with the Earth, in tune with Gaia, in harmony with Gaia. And, and Gaia is a wonderful mother. We look after her as she looks after us. So with the comments, I would like to invite you to ask some questions. And I would like to thank Kaduri Farm and the Earth, uh, Kaduri Earth Program for inviting me uh, to give this um, uh, contribution. And I would like to thank uh, all uh, Kaduri team for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satish. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your enthusiasm. And uh, I learned a new word today, tree, tree English. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure you're uh, quite fluent in tree English. Um, yes, I speak with trees yeah. and listen to trees. <laughs> so we've got lots of time now for questions and, and Satish loves to answer questions so that we can really address what's on uh, people's minds and in people's hearts. So uh, please feel free to uh, write in the chat box. 
Um, and and I will uh, uh, we will select uh, questions and I will read them out uh, to Satish so he he doesn't need to follow the chat box. And perhaps uh, while you're uh, continuing to reflect uh, and think about what you want to put in the chat box, and once again, please feel free to go right ahead now. Um, maybe I'll ask a question. Satish, you, you talk about expanding the mind and having this feeling of celebration. What is, we're, but, but life is full of so many distractions. So what's the best way to, to cultivate those feelings and to, to expand one's mind, would you say? Yes, Andrew. The, the thing is that every day we need to come back to our source, the inner source. Uh, in order to address the questions of the earth, society, we need to start with ourselves. Mahatma Gandhi always talked, he was a great uh, uh, activist. He worked for the uh, well-being of society and freedom and independence, as everybody knows. But his, his message was, be the change that you want to see in the world. You start with yourself, because you are a microcosm of macrocosm. I am a mi microcosm of macrocosm, all of us. And so when we begin with ourselves, and we have all the resources available to us, uh, we don't have to go uh, for anything, uh, for a shopping center to buy our imagination, our creativity, our compassion, our love, our generosity, all these wonderful qualities that we have, and they are in abundance. So if we cultivate these qualities through our meditation, uh, through our being in nature, uh, touching the earth, and you have a Kaduri farm, which is a wonderful example. Uh, I would like to see everybody being in touch with the soil every day. Don't worry too much, the big problems, start with small problem. How can I do make a difference myself today? If we all, 8 billion people, start with ourselves and 8 billion people do something different, something more gracious, something more creative, something more uh, earth-centered and nature-centered, then I think the world will be a different place. So each one of us need to start with ourselves. Then, of course, uh, we don't stop there because we are not as separate, uh, isolated ind individuals or separate beings. We start to communicate what we are doing. As you are doing, organizing this um, uh, uh, earth uh, talks and, and, a, and a program of, of talks and Kaduri Farm, communicate your ideas through art, through music, through poetry, through speaking, through uh, doing, through making. Only through communication, we can transform the world. And all the great transformers and change makers uh, as Martin Luther King or, uh, or, or Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Jane Goodall, uh, who had been to Karuri Farm many times and Vandana Shiva, many, many great uh, change makers are good at communication. So we all need to learn to communicate these good ideas through whatever means available to you. There's no one way to communicate. There are many ways to communicate. So that's a second uh, step that we can do. Be the change, then communicate the change. Communicate to other people. Don't just hold it in your head. Then the third step, Andrew, I would like to suggest is that organize the change because you communicate and you be, but then it doesn't, doesn't have a kind of power. But power comes when you come together, share things together, work together. So like you have a Kaduri farm, uh, in the same way we have Schumacher College, uh, we have Friends of the Earth, uh, we have um, Plum Village, uh, we have many ashrams uh, in India uh, and many other places. So organizing the change so that we can work together as a community, not just individual self. So these are the three steps I would like to suggest in answer to your question, that in order to address the problems of the world and the problems and the so many distractions in the world, what can we do? Start with yourself, be strong, be resilient, and practice what you believe in and live your life according to your ideals. And then communicate that change to other people and organize and join other people and work together. 
So be the change, communicate the change, and organize the change. And that way we can make a difference. Thank you very much, Satish. Now I have a, a question, <coughs> question from uh, Jasmine. What can you share about the last conversation you had with a tree or a river? Uh -huh. um, I have 15 apple trees in my orchard. And last time when I went to see uh, my orchard and my tree, the apple said, have apples and I'm here for you. It never asks, have you got a visa card? It never asks, are you rich or poor? Are you educated or uneducated? Tree spoke unconditional love and unconditional generosity and wanted nothing in return. Of course, I'm also a tree. And so I give something back to the tree, but tree asks nothing. So, so that unconditional nourishment, unconditional compassion, unconditional love and gift coming from the tree. And, and trees there, I'm here for you. And not only fruit, but Tree says, I'm here to give you shade. I'm here to give you oxygen. I'm here for you. That kind of offering coming from the tree. Same at the bottom of my uh, field garden, which you know, uh, is a stream and the water flows. And water says to me, be like water, be flexible flow like water, don't stagnate. That is what river talks to me. I sit by the stream, I observe the stream, I listen to the stream and I feel inspired. I feel nourished. It's, uh, the trees and the rivers are my teachers. Nature is the greatest teacher. Nature is my mentor. When I sit under the tree, and by the river, I feel nourished. Buddha sat under a tree and Buddha talked with the tree and tree helped him to be enlightened. And many, many great teachers in India, they sit by the bank of the river Ganges and Ganges tells them the lessons of freedom and flow and flexibility and nourishment and quenching the thirst of all living beings. If we can learn to live like water and if you can learn to live like a tree that's that they are our teachers we will be very happy so i listen to trees and i listen to the river thank you very much satish so the next question is from nicholas who says i recognize the immense peace that can come from a feeling of connection to each other and the planet Yet many religions seem to exist to provide a degree of consolation or justification for potentially harmful uh, actions, harmful to the environment. So in positioning caring for the earth as a spiritual experience, is there a danger of complacency? There is a difference between organized, institutionalized religious uh, orders and spirituality. <clears throat> the word spirituality simply comes from breathing. Sp inspirare, to breathe in. To expirare, to breathe out. And when you stop breathing, you are expired. <laughs> so, inspiration. So when you breathe in, you are connected with the earth. You are connected with nature. You are connected with, through air, because air sustains all life. And so I would like to separate the idea of organized, institutionalized religious orders 
which have labels and names like Christians and Buddhists and Hindus and, and Muslims and Jains and Sikhs and all those kinds of religious traditions and the spirituality. Now spirituality is all about compassion, love, relationship, generosity, helping each other, nourishing each other, caring for each other. These are the spiritual values which are common to all religions. So I would like to say that sometimes we have to go beyond religious labels and beyond religious uh, dogmas and doctrines. And we have to come to a, a more art-centered, nature-centered, human-centered, uh, soul-centered um, worldview. And when you have that, then there's no conflict. There's no contradiction. There's no complacency there. Complacency also comes to, oh, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Christian, I'm a Muslim. I have all the religious uh, things. I have the truth. I know the truth. I'm better than everybody else. If you have that kind of uh, thinking, then it's a complacent. And you, you just say, I'm here to, to just make my religion bigger and, and use everybody to make my religion bigger. So that complacency comes only when you are stuck in a dogma. But when you are connecting with the spirit and connecting the sp sp nature spirit, human spirit, and all spiritual dimensions, as I mentioned, then there's no complacency because you are all the time a pilgrim. You are all the time on a journey of transformation. You are all the time on the journey of um, journey of enlightenment, if you want to call it. You want to um, expand your heart and your mind and your consciousness to include all living beings and include the whole planet Earth. So I would say spirituality is actually helpful in transforming our consciousness and not a hindrance and not complacency. Uh, so we have to sometimes go beyond uh, dogmatic uh, religious uh, organizations to, to embrace this very uh, all-encompassing spirituality. Thank you, Satish. So I have another question here, and, and some, some people are sending questions directly to me, but I, I encourage you to put it in the uh, chat box to everyone. Um, this question is from Betty, who says, communication is needed. However, in Hong Kong right now, uh, poverty, there's a lot of poverty and poor people can't make time for their inner self. So what will be the way to assist them? <coughs> there are two kinds of poverty, physical poverty and a spiritual poverty. Mm. So we must not think only um, uh, about physical poverty. And also we should not think always putting uh, poor down. Pa physical poverty is a result of lack of compassion, a lack of sharing. So if we can cultivate our compassion and cultivate our sharing and, and our, our uh, relationship with each other, then we need not have any poverty. There is no shortage of anything. As I talked about trees, if you plant one seed in the ground, you get thousand apples from one seed. Earth is abundant, earth is generous. So this is why we are celebrating Earth Day to understand the generosity and, and, the, and the compassion of the earth. And so poverty is unnecessary Party, poverty is because of our, um, our egocentric thinking, and therefore we have to move from ego to eco, change from G to C. And eco means like ecology, uh, economy. Ecos is a Greek word like Gaia. Ecos means home. And everybody, all people in Hong Kong, they should feel at home. So there is no, Hong Kong is a very rich, rich, rich city, rich, rich place. And therefore, there's no need for poverty. So it's a lack of human organization. And, and that can be addressed if we all come together and, and see how we can, first and foremost, there should be a flooring beyond which no one goes down. Nobody falls down. A, a wonderful economist in England called Kay Roworth, and maybe 
um, you should invite her to give one of the uh, Kaduri Earth talk. Um, uh, Kate, Kate Roberts has written a book, a wonderful book. She's like a Schumacher um, called uh, Donut Economics. And the donut economics is that a donut has a two, two sides. One is inside and one is outside. The inside, you must not fall out of the donut because that's a kind of social limit. And, and the poverty comes because of you are uh, falling out um, of that uh, donut in the middle. And the outside uh, uh, limit is in nature. And you mustn't go beyond uh, that limit either to destroy nature. So if we can create a donut economics, then I think even in Hong Kong, which is not lacking any wealth or trade or anything like that, um, you can create a better uh, society. What we need is to change our philosophy and worldview. At the moment, we think that production and consumption is the mission of life. Economic growth is the end goal of life. And therefore, humans are being used as a resource for the economy. If you go to a business house, you will find every business house has a department called HR. HR stands for human resources. Now, this is a, a, a very um, confused word. I would say it's a very negative term. Humans are not a resource to make profit for the company. Humans are not a resource for production and consumption. Humans are not a resource for the econ economic growth. Economic growth, production, consumption, profit, all those should, should be the resource for human well-being. So I would like to change that human resources to human relationship. HR should stand for human relationship and not human resources. So the moment you give the dignity of life to every human being, then there's no need for poverty. At the moment, we lack that dignity of life. And we think humans are only a resource. Use them to make profit, to make money, to make production, to make consumption. Change that. So nature is also not a resource for the economy. Uh, we always talk about like human resources. We also talk about natural resources. So nature has become a resource for the economy. Humans have become resource for the economy. Economy has become the master. Economy is ruling the world. And humans and nature are in the service of economy. That is the cause of poverty. It's a spiritual poverty as well as physical poverty. So the moment you see the nature is a source of life and human relationship is uh, the, the source of dignity of life, then I think we can address uh, the question of poverty, uh, physical poverty and also spiritual poverty. Thank you very much, Satish. And yes, <coughs> we do have Kate Ra Raworth, is it? on our Raworth, R-A-W-O-R-T-H. Yeah. She is on our uh, list. And she's very busy, though, so we may need you to give her a nudge. Uh, whenever okay. we, I, I'll, be ha I'll be happy to help you. Whenever we need to find a speaker or a teacher for the farm, we ask Satish to give them a nudge, and this is the way uh, they come. <laughs> so, um, um, so there we have a lot of uh, uh, farm staff and volunteers uh, on on this uh, in this event. So please do. Uh, uh, come forward with some questions. And I see one has just come in uh, from Wong. Um, the slogan, save the earth, somehow creates a feeling that we humans can save the earth. But in fact, the earth uh, can do well without humans. Can you suggest a better slogan? Yes. I would say serve the earth is a better slogan. Serve the earth. We are in the service of life. And the earth is a symbol of life. So serve the earth, serve life, serve each other. And then there's no superiority. At the moment, we think that um, earth and nature has a value only in terms of how useful it is for humans. So we value nature, and therefore we want to say we save the earth because this is the, our 
uh, resource and therefore we have to save the earth. But the moment you say that earth has intrinsic value, nature has intrinsic value, nature and earth and forest and mountains and rivers and animals are not valued in terms of their usefulness to humans. Then your save the earth will change. And we will say that we are the earth. And, and by um, looking after the earth, we are looking after ourselves. You cannot have healthy people on a sick planet. In order to have health for humans, we need to have a healthy planet, healthy earth. And therefore, our work is to serve the earth, be the good servants of the earth, a good, a good carer of the soil. A gardener, a great good gardener, is a servant of the soil. Uh, I have a two acres of garden, and, and, and I go there, and I revere the earth, and I revere the soil, and I revere the seeds. So that reverence is the quality that we have to cultivate, reverence for the earth. And when you have reverence for the earth, then you are in the service of humanity, in the service of the planet earth, in the service of the forest, you look after, you care for each other. So for example, if you have a, a, a family, you look after your family, earth is a family. So you look after each other. Um, you don't say uh, that I'm going to save my family. Say, I'm going to be part of my family. I'm going to be an intri intrinsic part of family. So that feeling one with the earth, is to serve the earth, serve the humanity, serve the uh, mountains and forests and rivers. And this is why I say, consider the earth as sacred. Earth is sacred. Mountains are sacred. Life is sacred. Holy rivers, holy mountains. The, and, and this is what William Blake said, holy universe. William Blake uh, termed universe as holy. The moment you have a holy earth, then you are not thinking I'm a superior, I'm better, I can control, I can manage, and I can save the earth. Who are we? We are not in charge of the earth. We are an integral part of the earth. The moment you have that integral part of the earth idea, then you are not savior, you are a servant of the earth. So I would like to suggest, Logan, serve the earth, not save the earth. That's wonderful, thank you. Serve the earth, we'll, we'll remember that one. <laughs> And uh, here's a great question from Ling. It's great to connect to nature, as you mentioned. However, as countries prioritize development, more natural habitat as well as farmland is engulfed by urbanization. So our access to nature in the cities is getting more limited. How can governments resolve this fight over land between urbanization and nature preservation. Yes. <clears throat> um, I would suggest that um, the person who is asking this question read my book, Elegant Simplicity. I have, a, I have a suggested that in order to um, uh, uh, stop this uh, kind of unlimited growth of urbanization and, and uh, development, more roads, more railways, more airports, more seaports, more high-rise buildings, more shopping centers, unending, no end. So I would like to have an elegant simplicity in our urban design, where we live modestly. Of course, we have a nice, uh, beautifully built house, but should be handcrafted. So we need to bring more um, handcrafted uh, work in buildings, and in, in production and consumption. Because when you make something by hand, then it's a limited. You make something beautiful. You make something with love. And therefore you don't make this ugly development of high rise buildings and more roads and more railways and more airports and take, take, take from nature. So we need elegant simplicity and we need urban design, which is nature and culture dance together. At the moment, like city, central Hong Kong. Hong Kong had two parts. I love Hong Kong and, and, um, and there are many mountains and the farms and the, and the waterways and, and, and the beaches and so on, beautiful uh, parts. But the central Hong Kong is, has put nature out into exile. 
There's no room for nature in central Hong Kong. I would like to see uh, nature and culture living together in every city. The city should have lots of urban farms, lots of gardens, lots of uh, uh, parks, lots of even... In London, rivers have been all built over, concrete all over. Why? We have many, many rivers in, in London. They should be flowing. So nature and culture, nature and civilization, nature and urban development must be in harmony. So we need to redesign our, our cities and we need to have city planners who have this consciousness. At the moment, as I said, we see nature only as a resource for human development, human well-being, human economic growth. We need to change that view. Nature has intrinsic value and like we don't exploit, we try not to exploit humans, we should not exploit nature. We should live with nature in harmony. And the cities have to learn that. And so how governments can do it, I think we have to put that pressure on government. We have to have a citizens movement. Uh, uh, the person who is asking that question, I would like to ask you that communicate this idea to your fellow human beings. Organize something, a, a, a new urban planning, which is ecological, which is uh, regenerative, which is sustainable, and which is um, healthy and, and has a more nature in there, if we can create a movement, a, a citizen's movement, then people, uh, government will listen and, and pressure will be put on the government to change their policy. So the, the, the all great change come from the grassroots. They don't come from the top. The government will listen only if the grassroots movement changes. And at the grassroots, if people come with new ideas and good ideas for a new kind of urban uh, and, and, and a nature relationship and a partnership, then I think we can create a new kind of city. And cities are built by humans. Shanghai and Beijing and Hong Kong and, and New York and London and New Delhi and Mumbai, all these cities are built in the last 100 or 200 years. They are built by humans. They can be changed by humans. What is created by humans can be changed by humans. And therefore, do not be disappointed. Do not be disheartened. Do not be pessimist. Have optimism, have courage of your conviction, and go out and create a new movement and to change the uh, urban culture which we have created today. And that way we can put pressure on government to change their policy. Thank you, Satish. I'm reminded uh, um, of your bud principle, where, yes. where things should be, as I recall, beautiful, useful, and durable. Is that right? That's right. So that is under in my book, Elegant Simplicity. And I say that in urban, uh, in the question of urban development, if we can have that bud principle, have nothing, build nothing, create nothing, which is not beautiful. And at the moment in our, um, uh, sort of industrial, um, urban culture, we have forgotten the importance of beauty. And beauty is the food for the soul. If there's no beauty, soul will starve, and our imagination will starve, and our consciousness will starve. So we need to bring beauty back into our cities, in our urban culture. But beauty alone is not enough. Everything that we make beautiful should also be useful, and they should be durable, they should be sustainable, long-lasting, lifelong products. So beauty, utility, and durability, if these three things can come together, that is what I have written in my book. Thank you. So here's, here's a, an important question. Um, it's getting harder and harder to stay optimistic when we are bombarded by terrible news every day. What is your secret to preserve your inner resilience? <laughs> yes. Uh, if you want to be an activist, you cannot afford to be a pessimist. To be an activist, you have to be an optimist. Because if you, have, you are pessimist, you give up. You say, nothing can change. Nothing can happen. What can I do? Everything apart, everything. News is so bad. So the world is not only what you read in the newspaper. World is not only what you hear on the radio. World is not only what you watch on television. 
There are many, many wonderful changes and good things are going on in the world which are not in the news, which are not on a radio or television, but they are happening. Millions of mothers are looking after children. Millions of activists are serving the earth and conservation movement. Millions of people are engaged in nursing the, the old and the sick and the, and the babies. Um, millions of teachers are teaching um, uh, spiritual teachings and uh, practicing yoga. Millions of poets and painters and artists are doing wonderful work. So, and there are millions of people, farmers, small farmers in small villages are growing good food and, 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 and uh, looking after their families. So I'm an optimist. Things can change and things have changed. So you have to be uh, looking up at the examples of Martin Luther King, for example. Um, if he was a pessimist, he would not have done anything. I had a great um, honor and privilege of meeting Martin Luther King. And, and he was the embodiment of love, but he was a radical. And he, was, he went to prison for 29 times. Can you imagine if he was a pessimist? Will he go to prison for 29 times to end the racism and racial discrimination in the United States. And now, after putting him in jail, the US government for 29 times, now Biden, president in the White House, he has put a statue, an image statue of Martin Luther King in the White House, in the Oval Office. So things have changed a little bit. Obama could become president. You could not have thought of uh, somebody like Obama becoming president. So things can change, things have changed, things will change. Keep your heart, keep your optimism and be an activist. To be an activist, you have to be an optimist. You cannot be a pessimist and be an activist. You can be a journalist or you can be something else, but not an activist. And I'm an activist. I started, as you mentioned, Andrew, at age 18, as a Gandhian activist with Vinoba Bhave and land reform. Four million acres of land were given in donation to Vinoba for the distribution to the poor landless. That could not have happened if Vinoba Bhave was a pessimist. So Berlin Wall came down, apartheid came down. If Nelson Mandela was a pessimist, he would not have spent 27 years in prison. He was an optimist. And in the end, apartheid came to an end and Nelson Mandela was president of New South Africa. So I take these examples as my inspiration and I want to remain an activist up to the last breath of my life. Thank you, Satish. It's amazing how your optimism and activism only increases with time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so here's a question from uh, Sui Fa, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, it's a variation on a earlier question. How do we cultivate reverence for Gaia and recognize Gaia's sacredness? How can we counter <coughs> the dominion over Gaia? Yes, yes. In order to <clears throat> cultivate reverence for Gaia and reverence for all life, <clears throat> And, and, and consider the sense of the sacred, <clears throat> you have to cultivate love in your heart. Love is the answer to all your questions. If you have a love for the earth, love for nature, love for the forest, love for humans, love for the art, love for the craft, love for the soil, whatever you are in touch with, it's a love is the source of the sense of the sacred. Love is the source of identity with nature. We are one and therefore I love. So I would say how you cultivate that love. Just say, go out in nature, sit under the tree, sit by the river, observe nature, walk in nature. I am at the moment walking in my veil and I see the bluebells, carpet of bluebells interspersed with primroses, interspersed with um, uh, ramson, uh, the, the wild garlic, um, ransom. All these things, when I see how this beauty and this, this creativity of nature 
what more can I have? What else can I have than reverence and love and awe and wonder and amazement? So marry yourself to amazement. Marry yourself to the wonder of nature and cultivate love in your heart. And the moment you have that love, deep and profound love in your heart for nature, for creatures, for forests, for flowers, for everything, birds, whatever it is there, you will be able to cultivate. And it's not a one day process, it's a journey. You have to go day by day, step by step, every day you cultivate. How do you learn to play music? When you are a 10 years old, five years old child, you start to learn music. How do you do it? Day by day, you practice. And by the time you are 15 or 20 or 21 or 25, you become a good musician. So it's a long practice. So meditation is also a long practice. Cultivating love in your heart for nature is also a long practice. Cultivating a sense of the sacred is a long practice. Every day you have to meditate. Every day you have to read something poetic and inspiring and, and bringing you closer to a sense of the sacred, closer to uh, reverence for life, uh, closer to um, love of nature. So all those things are step by step, day by day, every day. Like for example, you eat food. You don't say I've eaten food today and then I, I don't have to eat anymore. Every day you have to nourish yourself. In the same way, every day you have to cultivate love and, and come closer to nature every day, day by day. And that's the journey, that's the process. Uh, love of nature and cultivating sense of the sacred is not a product that you get one day and that's it. It's a process of life, it's a journey of life. And every day, meditate. Every day, read poetry. Every day, look at uh, beauty of nature. Stop and have a sense of the oneness with nature. Uh, uh, don't be so busy, busy, busy that you have no time to be in nature. That's the way you can do it. Thank you. So here's a question from uh, Yi, Yi Jun. I'm a little bit worried about the fad in developing renewable, that the, the fad in developing renewable energy will blind people to other solutions, such as reusing and cultivating good spiritual qualities. Am I thinking too much and worrying too much? Um, yes, I don't think you are worrying too much. I think there's a limit to the amount of that renewable energy we can produce. Of course, uh, instead of using fossil fuel, which is causing uh, global warming, instead of using um, uh, all the kind of energy we use, like uh, uh, um, uh, nuclear energy, which does not produce perhaps carbon uh, emission, but still is very dangerous and, 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 uh, and, and not desirable. Um, it is better to use solar energy, wind energy, but modestly and moderation. Uh, if you put solar panels on the roof, it's okay. Because the roof can collect some energy and use certain amount of electricity in your house. In the same way, certain amount of water and you can collect water from your roof or collect water from here and there and use energy of the water. You can use certain amount of wind energy. But moderation is important. We cannot just put a whole field after field after field of solar panels. We cannot put windmills all over, all over our land, uh, landscape. Uh, it will be, uh, I talked about beauty. We also need to preserve the beauty of the earth. Uh, we cannot use the earth just for our windmills and our solar panels and our uh, need for energy. And what are we using that energy for? We are using energy to, for more production, more consumption. How much production consumption do we need? Production and consumption has become a goal in itself. And so we need to change that and, and say that we need moderate amount of uh, production and consumption and, and human energy, energy of our body, that is abundant. Eight billion people, we have stopped using our human energy. We don't build houses, we don't cultivate uh, fields, we don't make clothes, we don't make shoes, we don't make furniture, we are not using human energy. I think that's a waste of human energy.
energy. We are not using it. So I would like to see that we need, need to bring back use of hands. At the moment, our hands, we use them for um, a, a, a kind of um, smartphone and two thumbs or maybe a, a computer keyboard. Otherwise, we have no use of our hands. What are we doing with our hands? And so if we use our hands and use our human energy to cultivate, to produce, to, uh, to build, uh, then I think we will use moderate amount of um, uh, wind power, moderate amount of uh, solar energy, and, and that will be a good balance. So I'm in favor of uh, renewable energy, but with moderation. And I'm in favor of using more human energy. At the moment, we are trying to produce robots. If you produce 8 billion robots instead of 8 billion humans, how much energy are you going to use for that? So why do we need robots when humans can build and make and serve each other and look after each other? So we need to um, reduce our demand of, of energy and, and, and efficiency is more important. Um, so use energy efficiently and use less and use human energy more. And that way we can create a balance. Thank so you. So you're not worrying too much. Your worry is quite right. And, and I'll add that if everybody in, in the world had the same amount of energy as you, Satish, I think all our energy problems would be solved. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a question from Wanda. Today on Earth Day 2022, what do you see as the most inspiring developments, the most positive examples on the relationship between humans and nature? Okay. Yeah. This Earth Day is a day for our precious planet Earth. And, and many, many people are now engaged in regenerative food and farming culture. It is a regenerative culture. And many, many people are now learning. For example, at Schumacher College, we have created a new program called Regenerative Food and Farming. It's a one year long program. And we have got 20 students and they are young. And then similarly, we have a, a program for gardeners. There are 16 students there. So altogether 36 students, young people, are saying that we want to learn how we can become, uh, how we can create a regenerative food and farming culture. So at the moment, that is a most beautiful development and a most beautiful idea that young people are coming up with. And I attended um, uh, Oxford uh, Real Farming uh, Conference and there were many, many people who say, we want to cultivate food with love. Um, uh, uh, gardening and farming can become spiritual rather than just a commodity production. That is a new idea. That is a kind of wonderful idea. So I think we can come back to this regenerative culture, regenerative food and farming and, and cultivate our soil and, 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 and they serve the soil, look after the soil, that's the most positive uh, development of our time. And so on this Earth Day, I would like to urge you all that if you can find a chance, find an opportunity, even volunteer on Kaduri farm or any other farm and do something with your hand, touch the soil and, and regeneratively and lovingly cultivate some uh, trees or food or flowers or something. That is a new movement uh, and it's a wonderful movement. And I think on Earth Day, we should promote that. Thank you very much, Satish. So um, we have another question here and this may, may be the last question. So this question is from Rachel. She says, uh, in every era, there is transformation. And I feel like in our era, the world is being transformed into a virtual world with uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera. It might be bringing convenience uh, or it might be an amazing manifestation of human intelligence, but it feels like we're going backwards. We're no longer physically uh, so active. And I feel helpless. I feel like I'm being pushed by the mainstream into this uh, global 
uh, sort of transformation into the virtual world. Uh, some say this might be a spiritual elevation, um, as it means that we're moving into a more formless realm. But my heart does not feel good about this. So Satish, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, in the short answer is, I am not in favor of artificial intelligence. Because humans have a lot of intelligence, which is underused. Maybe 15 or 20 percent of our intelligence we use. 80 percent, 75 percent, 80 percent of our intelligence is unused, uncultivated. And we are wasting that. And then we are going for artificial intelligence. We are turning humans into robots. And robots, we are trying to make as humans so they can act like humans. This is not a spiritual path. I would like to see spiritual path following where you can use your human intelligence not to create more production, more consumption, more exploitation of nature, uh, more subjugation of nature, more controlling nature, because all the artificial intelligence and, and, and all the kind of technology uh, virtual world is how we control nature, how we, how we subjugate uh, the earth. So that is not the message of the earth day. The, earth, the message of the earth day is use your human intelligence and, and, and respect the intelligence of trees and animals and, and the forests and, and mountains and rivers and oceans. So I would say that you are on the right track. Don't give up. And we need to stand up for human intelligence, human consciousness, and reduce our use of, because if you create robots and, 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 and a driverless cars, then you have millions of more cars and no drivers. I think we need to reduce, reduce cars, not create driverless cars. We need to reduce our robots rather than create more robots. So creating a robotic society is not a message of the Earth Day. Earth Day is, stands for more uh, regenerative, more cyclical economy. At the moment, this robotic artificial intelligence will lead to a more linear economy. You take from nature, make into robots, and then they are obsolete, throw them away. So the waste and pollution is the, is the result of this kind of artificial intelligence and a virtual world. So if you want to have a more regenerative, more cyclical economy, more circular economy, where everything goes in the cycle, whatever comes from nature goes back to nature and regenerated, like nature regenerates, we, re we become regenerative culture, then I think uh, we can uh, look at, serve the earth and that will be a good celebration of living earth. But robotic culture, virtual culture, that is not a celebration of the earth. So I would say on Earth Day, our message is to, to serve the earth and, and celebrate the integrity of the earth and the intelligence of humans and the earth. Thank you very much, Satish. So I think we're coming to the conclusion now. And I really want to thank you for your, uh, your answers are so spontaneous and uplifting that I know they're coming from uh, a higher intelligence. There's, there's artificial intelligence and there's human intelligence, but then there's the higher intelligence. Absolutely, and I know, absolutely. You know, I would go for the higher intelligence rather than, <laughs> rather than artificial intelligence. I would like to seek higher intelligence, yeah. And really it's a great privilege for us to, uh, to witness this and to benefit from your wisdom. So I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. And please keep, keep, keep speaking and keep, and I hope you will visit us also soon. Uh, yes. Hopefully uh, uh, this year or next year, it, it will be possible. So thank you very much from all of us at Kuduri Farm and for all your support over the years as well. You've been our greatest supporter and uh, um, yes encouraging a lot of others to support us as well. So thank you very much. It has been my privilege and honor to be associated with Kaduri Farm and the Kaduri family and personally with you, Andrew. And, and you have devoted your life uh, to Kaduri Farm and taking care of nature. And uh, so you are a champion of Earth Day. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored.
And I want to thank each one of you for participating uh, today and for your questions. Uh, it's been really wonderful uh, to experience this. Uh, if you have any final comments, uh, and I see some are coming in in the chat box, please feel free to uh, put them in or any uh, expressions of, of gratitude for Satish. A lot of, a lot of expressions of gratitude coming in uh, the chat box, and we will keep a copy of that. Um, we will have some questions for all of you. There's a questionnaire that you'll be receiving shortly, and we would really appreciate it if you can uh, give us some feedback so that we can uh, refine and improve our Earth program. I also want to thank uh, those of you who uh, made donations. Um, we are expanding our programs at the farm, and they will be put to very good use for the Earth. Um, please do stay in touch with Kuduri Farm uh, by visiting the website uh, where you can sign up to become a friend of KFBG or a, a member. And uh, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. And you can find out uh, details about upcoming uh, talks in our Earth program as well. So as Satish mentioned, the next one in the series is it's actually on May 27th with Stefan Harding, a, a a Schumacher a College teacher, and it will be entitled Gaia and the Health of Our Planet. So yeah, we'll be moving from the more philosophical to the more uh, scientific uh, and back again, I expect. And uh, Stefan is a wonderful uh, speaker and teacher. Uh, we are hoping uh, later this year that this Earth program will uh, move uh, into the uh, how should we say, the, the real realm, uh, less virtual. And uh, we do have plans even for a, a possible new venue, um, which, which we will be calling the Food Hub. So please stay posted and we'll let you know on the website and other media uh, as that develops. So all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you very much, each one of you again, happy Earth Day. And I look forward to seeing you again. And I would like to give the final word to Satish. Okay. Um, I would like to, it's a more a spiritual level, I would like to say, even those who do some harm to me, I wish them wisdom and happiness. Hmm. Even those who do harm to me, I wish them wisdom and happiness. Thank you for that final contemplation. So thank you. Blessings to everybody and see you again. Thank you. So thank you very much, everyone. So this is the end. And if you want to join our upcoming talk, you may also scan our QR code and to visit our web page to learn more about this. And thank you very much once again. And see you guys next time. Goodbye.